the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of a tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I just praise you for your goodness and your grace, Lord. I thank you for your word. I pray that, that Lord, you would speak to us tonight through your word, that we would see the consequences of sin, Lord. But yet, Lord, may we see the grace that you want to pour out on us, Lord, and the love with which you love us. And I pray that we would be changed from the inside out. So, Lord, just work tonight by your spirit. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. What's that? Is it on? Podium mic? How's that? Much better. Okay. Gooder. More gooder. Now, two weeks ago, we discussed the conversation between Satan and Eve and the implications of her not knowing God's word as well as she should have and how all of it was really a failure of Adam to steward what God had graciously given him. And, of course, that includes God's word and it includes his wife. Adam was responsible for stewarding both as they were both gracious gifts of God. We also saw that what is recorded in Genesis 3 is the first sin of Satan. His sin came first. By trying to get Adam and Eve to disobey God, he was declaring himself free from the authority of God, and he was trying to get Adam and Eve ultimately to submit to his authority instead of God's, to follow him in sin rather than follow God. And we read those passages from Isaiah and Ezekiel that offer some clarification on who Satan was created to be and what happened to him after his sin. Now this Satan's sin is the first of three divine rebellions recorded in the Bible, with at least a fourth that's implied, and we're going to see these later in the book. Tonight, we turn our attention to the sin of Adam and Eve. Now, this event is usually referred to as the fall or the fall of man. It is the fall of mankind from their original created position into sin and spiritual death, and this sin, of course, changed everything. The result is that all of mankind since the fall has a natural disposition towards sin and towards disobedience to God. In our natural state now, men are children of wrath. We are children of the devil. Unsaved men walk according to the power of Satan. They are dead in sin, and they cannot, in that state, understand the things of God or even want to understand the things of God. That is because of what we call original sin. Original sin does not refer to this first sin we're about to read about. Original sin speaks to the condition of mankind. Every human is born with original sin. It means that we are, by our very nature, sinners. Why? Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the entire human race disobeys God and becomes a race of sinners, both literally as the only two humans for whom every human has ever been born became sinners, because remember, as we've seen, like breeds like, but also because Adam was what we would call our federal head or our representative as the first person created as the one to receive the word of God, who was given authority over the earth beginning in the garden, as the first prophet, priest, and king, Adam was the head of the whole race. Paul talks about this in Romans 5. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many die through one man's trespass, much more of the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man, that's Adam's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's disobedience, uh, by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. 
Now, the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen to that. He addressed this again in 1 Corinthians, talking about our, our final state and our resurrection from the dead. He says, for as by a man, meaning Adam, came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made of life. So we see that you are either in Adam or you are in Christ. And we'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's remember where we left off two weeks ago. Satan and Eve have their conversation while Adam stands idly by. Satan asks Eve a question that implies God's word may not mean exactly what she thinks it means. And Eve replies to the question with an answer that's actually further from the truth than Satan's question was. Because remember, Satan verbatim repeats what God said about eating of the trees, conveniently leaves off the exception of a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What he was doing was asking Eve, have you understood God properly? And she answers by adding to the word of God, whether on her own or because that's what Adam had taught her. She says, sure, we can eat of any tree we want, just not the fruit of a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, we can't even touch the tree, and if we do, we'll die. And Satan's response is where we left off. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now let's remember what the knowledge of good and evil is. Ultimately, what knowledge Adam and Eve are about to gain is a knowledge of spiritual death. They didn't understand that what God meant when he warned of a tree and said, In the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, that he was speaking of spiritual death. But Satan knows what God was talking about. He knows that Adam and Eve don't know what he knows, and so he subtly twists the truth. He says you will not surely die, but God knows you will know good and evil when you eat of it. Think about what Satan's saying. You won't die, and they won't die physically. They won't die according to their understanding of what God was talking about, at least not right away. And then Satan says, but you will know. You will have this knowledge. You will know what it means to die spiritually. That's what he's saying without Eve even knowing it. So what he says here is actually true, though the understanding is given to Adam and Eve, is not. Let's remember, the heavenly beings, they understand the result of disobedience. Satan knows that by disobeying God, he's earning spiritual death. All the heavenly beings know that if they disobey God, they will die. In fact, when Satan here says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil, the word for God here is in the Hebrew, Elohim. It's the plural form of Eloah, which means God, small g God, or God, big g God. And this word Elohim is used of Yahweh God about 2,000 times in the Old Testament. It's what in the Hebrew is called an honorific plural. It's when the plural is used of a single person or object to denote that they are the superlative of their class. In this case, it's to show that God is the God of all gods. He is the supreme God. But the word is also used to describe plural small g gods in the Old Testament. It's the same word used when Laban asked Jacob why he stole his gods. Why did you steal my Elohim? when his daughter takes his household items. See, I, I, idols. The idols were representations of real gods. And these gods are nothing more, more than fallen heavenly beings. They are the heavenly beings that are part of the third divine rebellion that we'll see later in Genesis. So Elohim is used in the Bible to speak of all the heavenly beings. Like in Psalm 82, we read that God has taken his place in the divine council and in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. In Hebrew, it says that Elohim has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the Elohim he holds judgment. He is Elohim, but the heavenly beings are Elohim. And the psalm goes on to declare judgment on the beings that rebelled, and God says, I said you are gods, you are Elohim, son of the most high. All of you nevertheless, nevertheless like men you shall die and fall like any prince. All was to say, when Satan says, you will not surely die, for Elohim, God, knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. This can just as easily be translated, God knows that when you eat of it, you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. Like the heavenly beings, like Satan himself, having this knowledge that humans do not. Because remember, the serpent, the Nakash, the heavenly diviner, is actually telling Adam and Eve that they are going to gain knowledge he has. Now, many modern commentaries prefer this view, that Satan is offering Adam and Eve a chance not to be like God, like Yahweh, but to become like the heavenly beings who are above humanity in the created hierarchy. And I find that most plausible, because as we've seen and we'll see again, when God says that Adam and Eve has become like one of us in knowing good and evil, 
The one of us language precludes a Trinitarian reading. It points to God speaking to the Elohim as in the heavenly beings. So if this is what Satan is offering them, he isn't really lying. Adam and Eve are about to know what Satan knows. They are about to find out that disobedience means spiritual death. Remember, he's crafty. So t- Satan tells Eve she'll be like, what are the gods if she eats of the tree? And we read this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. A few things to note here. First, let's remember what God did back in chapter 2. We read this, And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we saw when we looked at this, all the trees that God made to be for food were both pleasant to see and good for food, life-giving food. That includes the tree of a knowledge of good and evil. Remember, it wasn't a poison tree. What made it different from this every tree that God made is that this is the only tree that God commanded not to eat of. So Eve looks at this tree, which looks good, and it says she considers it, and she comes to the conclusion, hey, this is like all the other trees. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was the light to the eyes, like all the trees God made, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, just gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. See, the tree is good for food. In fact, the fruit of this tree may have been the same fruit as other trees that Adam and Eve had already eaten from. Because it wasn't the tree, it was God's command that mattered. But there's more here, because the tree doesn't just look good. It doesn't just produce fruit that's good for food. We read that she sees the tree was to be desired to make one wise. This is the first time we see human desire enter into the picture. And desire itself, of course, isn't bad as long as our desires are in line with God's. But when they aren't, Sin is never far behind. So Eve here is like the seed sown among the thorns in the parable of the sower. When Jesus says others are sown among thorns, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. This is exactly what's happening to Eve. Her desire for the fruit and the wisdom she believed it would bring have now overridden God's word. As James tells us, he says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. It's exactly what's going on here with Adam and Eve. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The tree was desired to make one wise. It was desired to give one understanding. Here, God's word is being subjected to the wisdom of man, to the rationality of man. Satan has convinced Eve that God's word should be tested according to her logic. This is what she's doing. And this has been a problem since that moment, well, up until this moment. We'll see it over and over again in Genesis. You see it throughout the whole Old Testament. You see it into the time of Jesus and beyond, right up until today. The reason that many do not accept the authority of the Word of God is because it doesn't make sense to them. Or it doesn't line up with their interpretation of their experiences. It doesn't line up with what they think they know. And, of course, we all know what's going to happen to those who choose their own knowledge over God's word. But here's the worst part of this. This actually happens in the church. Even well-meaning people who consider themselves Christians subject the word of God to their minds and their hearts, their ideas and their experiences. And while we are told and should think about what we read in the word of God, we should think long and hard about it, try to understand it. The goal is to understand what God said and submit to that. Not outthink God's word so we can make it mean what we want it to mean. And there are truly regenerate people that do this. And for the most part, they stay stuck where they are in their faith. They wind up being no good to the kingdom because they have not really submitted themselves to the word of God. And when that happens, sin isn't far behind. So we see here Eve subjects the word to her rational mind. She looks at the tree and considers it. 
and then she decides the fruit does look good. And like I said, the fruit was good, except that God commanded not to eat of it. And we need to be careful we don't do what Eve did. There are plenty of things we can do that are not evil in and of themselves. Just because something is good doesn't mean it's God's will for us. And I'm sure that Moses wanted the Israelites reading this to understand that. They couldn't withstand the temptations in the wilderness. I mean, think about it. Israel was actually tempted to go back into slavery in Egypt. Moses knew they needed to learn to withstand the temptations they would find in their garden of the promised land. Because if there's something we're good at as humans, it is rationalizing what we want. It is rationalizing a way to do what we want to do. We can take what's good and turn it to evil by putting our desires over God's will. And that's what Eve does here. And that leads very naturally into the experience part of this. Many interpret the word of God through their experience rather than their experiences through the word of God. Right? So Eve now has already rationalized the good of the tree. So the next, th next thing she's going to do is take of its fruit. And note, this comes up for the eating. I want us to think about what happens here. Eve tells Satan, we can't eat of a tree, neither could we touch it. And that touching part was an addition of man, whether her or Adam. But notice the order of the conversation. Eve says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of a tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Eve ends with that, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And Satan says, you will not surely die. So what do you think went through Eve's mind when she grabbed the fruit, when she touched it? She pulled it off the tree, and she didn't die. Think about it. She thought touching the tree would mean death. Satan says it won't. So she touches the tree. She does first what God didn't really forbid, but that she thought would mean death, and she doesn't die. Why not eat of it too then? See, this is what happens when we don't know the word of God. I can't tell you how it drives me crazy when people talk about what the Bible says and then say something the Bible doesn't say. If I hear one more person say that God helps those who help themselves, I'm going to start swinging. I'm sorry, I'm going to. That is the complete opposite of what the Bible teaches. But listen, even if that's not taught so plainly like that, that is a lot. That is what a lot of Christian churches teach. And you know what happens? People will try to help themselves in their own power. And when things don't change, and because they believe that God should have helped them because, well, hey, I'm trying to help myself, all of a sudden they believe God lied. He's not doing what he said he would. Or worse, they believe they need to do something in order to receive God's help, right? Oh, I need to help myself first. And a lot of churches will apply this to their salvation. And when they do and do and do what they think they have to do, but never experience the life-changing power of God, either they live in guilt, like, wow, I'm such a horrible sinner that God's rejected me, or worse, they blame God and walk away. So what happens, we subject God's word to our experience. This is what Eve's doing. She thought, she believed that God said, touch the tree and die, but she touches the tree and nothing happens. So what's the next logical step? Eat. Now do what God actually forbade, because you don't know which one's actually true. You don't know the word of God. Hmm. God didn't do what I thought he would when I did what I thought he said I shouldn't do, so I'm going to do the other things God said I shouldn't do. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Like us, she subjected God's word to human rationality, to her own desires, to her own experiences. And sin isn't far behind. Listen, the primary purpose of God's word is to give us a proper understanding of sin. Paul says in Romans 3 that this is why God gave the law. He gave the law so his people would understand sin. He was preparing them to enter and live in the promised land by giving them an understanding of sin. And God's prohibition of eating the fruit of the tree was graciously given to, given to Adam and Eve so they could understand sin. And as I said, they knew eating of a tree was sin. But Eve's deceived. She touches. She doesn't know the word of God. Nothing happens, so she eats and she breaks God's command. Then she gives some to her husband who's with her. Again, remember, Adam's standing right there while this is all going down. See, he should have known Satan was lying, right? He received the word of God. Did he know Satan was lying? Well, 
Well, I would say that ignorance is no excuse for breaking God's commands because the Bible says that. As we've already seen, I don't think Adam is sitting in ignorance here. First, if Adam was fooled along with Eve, the only intentional or high-handed sin is Satan's. But as Paul said, Adam wasn't fooled. Adam made a choice. And realize, Adam did not have original sin as created. He was, as we saw, perfectly morally neutral. He had no disposition towards sin. That means that Adam freely, in the truest sense of the word, freely, Adam freely chose to eat knowing God forbade it. That's why God doesn't allow him to push off blame on someone else. Adam chose to switch his loyalty. What Adam did was worship the creature rather than the creator. Just listen to Romans 1 for a second and think about what Adam did here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things, creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. See how it so clearly describes Adam and Eve at the fall? How they suppressed or denied the truth God revealed to them? Especially Adam, he knew what the truth was. He heard it directly from God. What was known about God was evident to him because God had shown it to him. That God is God. That God was the creator. That God spoke the truth. This was evident to Adam. But Adam didn't honor God. He wasn't thankful for all he had from the gracious hand of God, the garden, Eve, God's word. But his thinking, his rationality, and his heart, his own desires, led him astray because he placed them over the revealed word of God instead of subjecting them to the word of God. And seeking for wisdom, Adam and Eve actually became fools. And their bodies were dishonored in what they did. Nakedness was now a problem because of sin, as we'll see. Because they exchanged the truth for a lie. Whether he worshiped Satan, or his own desires, or his wife, or the idea of autonomy. No matter what, Adam put himself, and therefore really Satan, on the throne. Now, I don't know that Paul had the fall in mind in this passage, but it applies. Like it does to Israel. Read that passage again and think about the history of Israel. It fits. Think about the world that Paul lived in, the Greco-Roman world when he wrote this. It fits. Think about fallen men today, and it fits. And with Adam, Satan got what he wanted. Every time someone exchanges the truth they know for a lie and worship anything other than God, Satan gets what he wants. And Adam's sin is more than just eating the fruit. It was his failure to steward what God gave him. Remember, he was to start carrying out the creation mandate by having dominion over the garden so he could spread it over the whole earth. He gave it dominion up to Satan. He gave it up to satisfy his own desires. His sin was also failing to take care of his wife, physically and spiritually. As the first prophet, priest, and king, he was responsible for her to God. And his sin was worshiping the creature rather than the creator. So ultimately, Adam became an idolater. That was his sin. He placed someone or something else over God. He submitted himself to the authority of a false god, to lies, to his own desires, and to his own understanding. And through this sin, everything changed. We read, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Their eyes being opened talks about them all of a sudden gaining knowledge. And the knowledge is that they now deserve spiritual death. They were now sinners. And that nakedness that at the end of chapter 2 was perfectly normal and perfectly fitting for God's perfect creation, that nakedness that didn't make them ashamed now makes them ashamed. Their bodies have been dishonored through sin, as we saw in Romans 1. See, they weren't ashamed before sin, but now sin is the cause of their shame. 
Now they know, same word as knowledge of the, the tree, knowledge, speaking of a tree. They know they're naked and they're ashamed and they know they need to be covered. Eve wanted to eat because the fruit was desired to make one wise. Her and Adam have some new insight now. As we saw, the word for naked and the word for crafty are actually related words in the Hebrew. Now that they had fallen into sin, the couple's nakedness goes from a blessing to a curse. And they have become something like Satan. Their nakedness now represents him and not God in whose image they were made. See, through their sin, they made themselves more into the image of Satan. And the natural order is now broken in this way shows us how sin affects man's relationship to God and also man's relationship to each other. The harmony inherent in sinlessness is broken. Man now has to hide himself from God and from others. This is what happens to Adam and Eve. They now know they're naked, so what do they do? They try their own way and their own power to cover their nakedness. They want to cover their shame. They want to cover their sin, but they can't do that. Sinners can't make up for their own sin. Sinners can't hide their own shame and nakedness. Their covering is woefully insufficient, and they know it. Because even though they covered their nakedness with their own coverings, Adam still sees himself as naked. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. See, what was once the greatest blessing, the very presence of God, was now terrifying for Adam and Eve, right? They wanted to gain wisdom. What's the Bible say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here, God walks among them, and they are afraid. Remember how the promised blessings of God for obedience for Israel ends in the book of Leviticus. We've looked at this already. He says, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you will be my people. That God walked among his people meant that his presence was with them. It, it signified that he was their God and they were his people. But God also said they must remain holy for him to walk among them. Deuteronomy 23, because Yahweh your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give up your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. See, Adam knew it was coming. Adam didn't want God to see his nakedness. He didn't want his indecency exposed before God. Because remember, before this, God walked among Adam and Eve, even while they were physically naked. He walked among them and the heavenly beings in the garden, and his blessing was on them all. Because the blessing is his presence. But after sin, once they chose not to be holy unto God, the presence of God becomes something to be avoided. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord, God, among the trees of the garden. Here we're told God, like I said, is walking in the garden. This is what we call an anthropomorphism. It is a human quality or action ascribed to God. Right? God, as Jesus said, though, is spirit. Spirits don't walk. The same gospel tells us that no one has ever seen God. The only God is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And, of course, here the writer of the fourth gospel is explaining how Jesus was God incarnate. Well, the fact that God is walking here, the God who is spirit and no one has ever seen except the only, the only God who is at the Father's side, which is Christ, means that what we have here is a visible appearance of God, what is called a theophany. That means this is an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. It is God the Son taking on a physical, though here temporary, form to interact with man. We'll see all the physical manifestations of God in the book of Genesis are Christ. In fact, all the appearances of Yahweh in the Old Testament are appearances of the pre-incarnate Christ. Christ has always been how God reveals himself to man. This is why Paul refers to the one who Israel sinned against. The whole business of the fiery serpents. He says they sinned against Christ. Jude says it was Jesus that saved Israel from Egypt. It's all Christ. But also notice Yahweh God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The word cool here is the word ruach, which would mean spirit. Same word from Genesis 1-2, where the spirit is hovering over the face of the waters at the beginning of creation. So what we see here is an indication of the Trinity. Yahweh God, walking in physical form, in the spirit. And what does this triune God now do? Well, he has three questions. Look what he says. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? 
And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of a tree of which I command you not to eat? God asked three questions. First, he asks, where are you? It's a question about position. But God knows where he is physically. Of course he does. It's not about a physical position. Remember, these questions are for God's benefit. They're for our benefit. They're for the benefit of those who are reading this. He asks, where are you, Adam? Where, what is your position? What is your condition? Where are you? Are you still me, under me? Or are you under some other authority? As we saw, the New Testament describes two positions for man, in Adam or in Christ. God here is asking Adam where he is because he knows Adam's position has changed. He has tried to free himself from God's authority, and he's become a sinner. He is in a different condition than he was. It is a question about relationship to God. Adam has removed himself from the original relationship he was created to be in. The second question is related to the first. He says, who told you you were naked? He wants to know whose authority he's placed himself under. Adam, where do you get your knowledge? Who do you listen to? Remember, before sin, they were already naked, and they knew it, and it wasn't a problem. Right now, they have the shame of sin. By trying to break from God's authority, they fall into the sin. So God's asking, hey, who told you? Whose authority are you under? Who or what have you listened to instead of me? And the last question is, have you eaten of a tree which I command you not to eat? So God asks, now that you've denied my authority and placed yourself under some other authority, what'd you do? It's a question about action, right? Because actions are either faithful to God or they're not. And who we are, our position, and what we believe, what our authority is, will always determine what we do. Condition, authority, behavior. And for fallen man, it's all sinful. Sinful condition leads to a misunderstanding of authority, leads to sinful actions. So these are questions everyone needs to answer. Right? Where are you? Where are you? What is your relationship to God? Two, whose authority are you bowed to? And three, what have you done? And recognizing all of this and coming to God to get in a right standing with him, bowing to his authority and repenting of what we've done, well, that's called salvation. So these would be very important questions for Israel to answer as they prepare to enter the promised land. Very important questions for us and very important questions for every person. The most important questions. I want to know something else, though. Who does God call to? First, we read this. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of a day, and the man and his wife hid themselves for the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then we read, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? God only calls out to Adam. He addresses him. He asks, where are you? And the you is in the singular. Who is God holding responsible for what just happened? Then note Adam's telling response. He said, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This is the first time anybody but God uses the first person singular pronoun. All the other eyes in Genesis before this are about God. Like when God says, behold, I have given you every green plant, yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heaven and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And when we read, and the Lord God said, it's not good for the man that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. All the eyes are about God and what he's graciously given. Here Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. It's all about what man does. There's a shift being signaled here, right? Now that Adam has fallen, like man in our fallen state, it is the I that matters, not God, not what he's done, what I do. This hasn't changed. Look at the world today. What matters to people? And this is why we can so easily, easily rationalize our sin. If it's all about me, it's easy to do. It's what Adam and Eve did. God asked, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of a tree which I commanded you not to eat? And all the yous in this verse are singular also. God is still speaking to Adam. He asked those questions to the one who received his word. He asked those questions to the one who was given the responsibility of making sure something like this didn't happen. Right? Adam should have protected the garden, should have protected his wife, 
He should, have he should have stewarded what God gave him. He should have obeyed the word God gave to him. Now look how far he is from that. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And Adam fails to protect her. He stands idly by while she's tempted and takes the fruit of a tree. Now he blames her for the whole thing. That's human nature, isn't it? Rationalize, rationalize, rationalize. Push off blame as much as I can. But also notice, Adam blames someone else. He doesn't just say, God, the woman did it. She gave me the fruit. Now he says, the woman that you gave me, God, she gave it to me. She did it. You know, one of those gracious eyes we just read about God was giving Eve to Adam. Now Adam, who became a sinner and can only focus on the eye, he blames God for giving her to him and then blames her for all that's happened. Just like when he stood by and watched Satan fool his wife, Adam is denying the responsibility God gave him. That's what part of sin is, denying the responsibility we have to God. And note, please, that what Adam says here, none of it's untrue. God did give Eve to Adam. We just read, Eve did give Adam the fruit and he ate. What he says is 100% true. That's not his intent. Just like we saw everything Satan said to Eve was true, was meant to deceive. Adam has already become like the serpent. Sin makes man less like the image of God, as I said, and more into the image of Satan. It's true for every human. It was true for Adam, and it was true for Eve. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. God turns his attention to Eve. And again, it's not that God doesn't know what happened. He's not asking Eve because he's short on information here. God is asking Eve because her sin of ignorance is still sin. The devil made me do it is not an excuse. But note also, what she says is not untrue. The serpent did deceive her. We see the universal actions of a sinful heart. Deny, push up responsibility, rationalize, blame, protect the eye, right? This is what fallen men and women do. They are more in the image of a deceiving serpent than they are the God who made them and graciously gives to them. So what we see here is a drastic and total change in mankind. This is what sin did. It changed who we are. It changed our relationship to God. It changed our relationship to each other, and it placed us under the domain of Satan. That is what the fall is. This is where a natural man still is. Next week, we'll see what God's going to do about it. Any questions? Jeffrey's got it. Uh, question for you. Did if for me? For <laughs> sorry. No, for the crowd. For the crowd. <laughs> Should we lynch him or not? Oh, I'm sorry. That, um, if if Adam did not eat of the fruit of the tree, uh, the fruit of the tree of good and evil, would we be in this state now? Well, two. two Two parts to the answer. Number one is that Adam had already sinned, right? This is all, this is all one process of sin that we see, right? By, if, even if he had just let Eve eat, which he did, he would have sinned. But no, I, I don't think we would. I, I think that though God did not, God is not the author of sin, God did not create sin, God did not tempt them, this is all part of God's plan, all right? You think, about, you think about Adam and Eve in the garden, they were... You know, they were given all these wonderful things by God. They were given a mission by God. They were perfectly morally neutral, right? No leaning towards sin at all. Yet, sin would always be a possibility. If not them, maybe Cain. If not Cain, maybe Lamech, like, right? Someone would have sinned somewhere along the line. This is part of God's plan because, because this happened now and Jesus Christ comes, the punishment for sin is taken away, right? Sin didn't exist. Jesus comes to take away the punishment for sin, 
the Holy Spirit helps us break the power of sin, and then when Jesus comes back, he's going to remove sin, right? There was no fact of sin before there was sin. There would have always been the possibility of sin if there was no sin. Now there is sin, Christ comes to undo all of that. So part, all part of God's plan. Second question. Oh, unless somebody else. Uh, when you answer something in, for me, which was uh, um, a question, when, when God said, uh, you, you, um, I'm going to create someone like us, I thought he was talking about the Christ and the Holy Spirit, but actually- When God says, let us create man in our image, in yes. Our image. When he says, let us create man in our image, then it says, in the image of God, he created them. But that is a Trinitarian us. When we come later and he says, one of us, you don't get that kind of language of the Trinity. Even Jesus, he'll have the we, mm -hmm. right? But there is no one of us, because then you separate the essential unity of God. Mm -hmm. So actually, when you said uh, Elohim, means the God and small gods. Right. So when he said that, he was actually talking about this, the small gods too. Am I right? Or what, When Satan says you will be like God, I think right. it's better to understand that you will be like gods, like heavenly beings, okay. because they're higher, in the, in, they're higher in the hierarchy of creation. And they knew already. They, this, is, this is why angels are not redeemable. They knew going in mm -hmm. that sin means death. And my last question, if I can read it. Oh. Do you believe the servant stayed around when God was basically after Adam and Eve did their thing and God said, this is... Yeah, because we're going to see at the end of it, he, he actually pronounces a curse of a serpent who's still there. Okay. And we see the curse of a, you know, again, not, not actually a serpent, actually a, a heavenly being, a, Glowing angel, right? Right. When God uses the terminology of you're going to go around and eat dust the rest of your life, we'll see what that really means. But when you read the Ezekiel and the Isaiah passages, you realize that now Satan is evicted from heaven, from a divine council, from God's presence, right? That's why later in like the book of Job, when Satan, Satan still has access to God, mm -hmm. and when God says, where have you been? What does he say? He's Walking to and fro on the earth. He's now on the earth. He is now, he basically has domain of the earth. But if I remember correctly, you know, my, I won't be able to say exactly how it is. When, G, when Jesus says, I have seen Satan fall like a lightning to the earth, is that he's mentioning before or at that moment when, and I can't remember the, uh, I don't know if I'm explaining myself or else. No, he's, he's, I think he's making a direct reference to the curse that God pronounces on the serpent at the end of his chapter, because he says that when the 70 return, from their mission, and what's, what do they say to him? They say, even the demons are subject to us. And he refers back to the curse, right? And what's the curse? That you're going to, the head of a serpent is going to be crushed. And what does he say to them? You're going to have the ability to stomp on serpents. So he's talking about the, the curse that God pronounces on Satan. I'm, I'm wondering if you notice the blanket around me. <laughs> yeah, uh, for some reason the air is on. I can't explain it. We're working on it. I have another hypothetical for you. Okay. Um, when God came to Adam and Eve and said, what have you done? They denied, they shifted blame. What if they had said you, we sinned or they sought out God afterwards. I mean, I, would that have so, been said, well, that eventually, um, you know, Cain or Lamech or someone else would have. Do you think, would God have forgiven them? Would it have gone, would they still have faced the punishment? I don't, I, no, I don't think so. Again, it's a hypothetical we're yeah. talking about, right? Yeah. But until God pronounces the judgment and pronounces the promise in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the serpent, there was no promise for them to look to and believe in and have faith in that would make them forgivable to God, right? right? So at this point, as far as they know, that's it. They now have the knowledge, sin means spiritual death. They don't know that there's a way out of it. God's about to give them one.
I think also once they had fallen into sin, that was just uh, like because they were now in sin, they didn't have the capacity, as the Bible teaches us, those in sin can do nothing but sin. They kind of like lost the capacity to do, I think, the hypothetical that Joe's talking about in a sense too, right? Yeah, they'd be in like a Romans 3 state, right? We're none seeking after God so like in their sin, so yeah. Uh, my question is, when Satan spoke the words, I want to be like the Most High, and, and when, in my understanding, that's the first time that he rebelled. And, and when that happened, he was cast out of heaven, I guess onto the earth. I mean, it, it seems like that was a different... Uh, 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 thing than what we were talking about right now. so what, what I said was I, I believe that um, when Satan sinned when he tried to deceive Adam and when he tried to deceive Adam and if that that is the sin that's talking about in the Old Testament where he's cast from the mountain of God and all that so you, you have you have the Garden of Eden which we discussed previously was up on a mountain right and that is where the divine council is where heaven met earth Satan sinned. Satan I don't believe thought I could become God Right? He knew, he knew who he was. But if Satan could free himself from the authority of God and get the other creation to follow him, it doesn't matter that God's still there. Right? Now, he is like the Most High if he has mankind worshiping him. So when he says, I will be like the Most High, I, I believe that's what it's referring to. I'm going, I'm going to be the one with the authority over man and God's creation. You know, if, if I don't consider myself under his authority anymore, it doesn't matter that he's there. Right? I don't think Satan believed he could be somehow subject God to him or be like God. Right. Well, I, I had always under the understanding that, that the first, in my idea, that was happened. And then while he was cast down to earth, and that's when later on he fooled. Yeah, I think that's this event. I think you can follow the same thing, kind of like Eve, like sees the tree, considers it, sees it's good, right. desires it. You know, Satan sees an opportunity thinks about it, desires to be like God, then tries to deceive Adam and Eve to get them to worship him rather than God. Where'd our, where'd our mic man go? Can, can I ask a question that leads more or less around what uh, Joe asked? Okay. Which is, in jo and God is, is, is sinless, is, is pure. I don't know the words to say about him, he's great. Um, but where Joe was going, if God, if God can't say to Adam and Eve, um, or when they said, I'm sorry, you know, I sinned, he, 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 he can forgive it, but it's, he, he, he's, uh, he can't forget it. If, am I making some sense there? Or? No, I think maybe, maybe this is where you're trying to go. Maybe you're not. I don't know. No, because God is perfectly just, you can't, he can't just take sin that has been committed and say, ah, that's Forget good. about it. Don't worry about it. There has to be a payment for that sin, yeah. which is why he makes the promise of Christ. Okay. Good man. Yeah, more on that. It seems that um, the sin had already occurred. The fall had taken place. Regardless of what their actions or reactions or falling down in front of God, there was already a fallen race. That took place. That was accomplished. Right. So yes, all they could possibly do, which they'll find out, is come back to God, the same God, for redemption, forgiveness. But sin must be paid for because as you just said, God is just. We don't want justice. Right. <laughs> we want grace. Everybody says, oh, I want justice. No, you don't. Because <laughs> I know what the end is. You're already guilty. Right. So that's all they could do. Right. But that's where it starts. And then that is the gospel in the making, which to this day is foolishness to them who are perishing. Yeah. They can't see it. First Corinthians 1.18. They, right. Indeed, they can't understand it because it's spiritually discerned. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
There wasn't any. It was helpful commentary. When we get to heaven, is Adam and Eve going to be there? I think so, because we'll see at the beginning of Genesis chapter 4, God makes a promise that the seed of the woman will crush the head of a serpent. She's the only woman there is. But when uh, Abel is born, she believes this is God gave me the man that's going to save us. When Abel's killed and then Seth is born, she says, God has given me another man. So she's, she's looking forward to the promise. So I believe that they did place their faith in God's promised offspring that would undo what they did. So I do think Adam and Eve will be there, yes. Probably not in, you know, leaves, but. <laughs> exactly. So that then begins the, 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 the journey of humans expecting God's, okay, God, this, is, this is the moment. Yeah, th this is what, when he meant until it's actually God who decides when, not the humans decides when God is ready. As he sent uh, Jesus Christ, right? Am I? I'm, try to follow, I'm trying to follow her thought of, you know, like she said. Ah, forget. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, I, I got a question, and I think you maybe be the person to untangle this one. In Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the great war in heaven, and then you probably heard of this in Revel in Genesis 1:1 between 1:1 and 1:2, where God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was. Now, this makes more sense to me about the fall having after Satan gets his plan to get dominion and be like God because now he has a whole underling class he can rule over. Um, what's going on within the war of heaven when a third of the, a third of the stars? Now, people say the stars are the, the, the third of the angels rebelled. That's always been a question I haven't been able to it always like uh, I always wondered about that. So yeah, so a few things. Yes, other angels do rebel in the Book of Revelation. Whenever you see a third, it just it's just referring to a partial amount of something. It doesn't mean a literal third Does of anything. Does this mean it happened a long time ago? No. Or so actually? what that's referring to, where the, so there's there's two stages to Satan's um, being thrown out of heaven. First, he's evicted from heaven. He no longer lives. No longer part of a divine council, doesn't live in God's presence on the earth, still has access. Once Christ, in the first, in, you read in uh, Revelation 12 about the woman who's the Israel woman. and the child that is born, and, right? That's yeah. Christ. We're told in the New Testament when Christ ascended to heaven, he put all rulers and principalities and authorities yes, under sir. him. So that, that vision of the war in heaven is the spiritual battle that goes on at the cross. When Christ, become, when Christ undoes what undoes sin, overcomes Satan, and that is when Satan is literally evicted from heaven. Satan has no more access to God. That is why Satan is now prince of this world. Understood. That. <clears throat> wow. So that happened in the battle uh, on the cross. That's when the. Wow. The whole what they would call the Christ event, the death, resurrection, the, the, the force ascension, was, all of that. The exceeding greatness, power that rose him from the dead. That power that was to over, that these things try to fight against happening. I, yeah, when, I, when, when Christ actually comes and achieves what he achieves, all of the rebellious angels are permanently evicted from God's okay. presence. What we just read in Psalm 82, right? Yeah. God sits among the gods, the, yeah. you know, the, the heavenly beings, and pronounces judgment on them. He's pronouncing judgment on, on heavenly beings that had already sinned. You're going wow. to die like men. Once Christ overcomes, they're evicted from God's presence. Now Christ rules He's the king, king, lord of lords. Right. Thank you. Kings and lord of lords. It's about spiritual angels and whatever you, that are uh, spiritual well, no, princes. Well, no, Christ, Christ reigns. Christ is king. Right? He, he is king. Not everybody knows it, but Christ is king. Right? So the rulers, the powers, the authorities, which refers to their dominion over the earth, they're thrown out of heaven now. They're here. They're no, lo they, they're no longer in charge. Right? This is why Christ says, like in the return of his 70, I will give you power. 
right, to tread on serpents. What, what we're supposed to do is, and we'll see this when we get to chapter 11, is supposed to un, we're going to undo the great sin of mankind at Babel when we take back the world for God. So as those who are born again, we have authority over Satan. We have authority over the, over the fallen heavenly beings. They don't have authority. It might not play out that way in real time, right? But we have authority over them. Once we're regenerated, we are no longer under their dominion because Christ is king. You gotta see all jokes into the microphone. Um, Christ tells us that when we covet something, even though we haven't taken it, or we have already sinned, correct? Um, so I'm just wondering, as soon as Eve thought of touching the tree, did the fall occur? Yeah, the, the, I, the, what I said is it's a process that we see there. The sin already occurs, right? Mm -hmm. Just based on the, just the sin of omission by Adam, not doing what he was supposed to do, was sin. The fact that Eve decided to put her own mind and desires over the word of God was sin. The whole, it's the whole thing. It's not just the eating of the fruit. It's the whole thing, right? It's the same thing for us. First comes, that, that was like, that, that was Christ's whole point in the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's not the, the adultery is sin, absolutely. But the actual taking of the fruit happens way after we've already considered in our hearts and saw that it was good and we desired it, in, you know, contrary to God's word. That's already the sin. Same thing happened for Adam and Eve. Right. It, it seems that uh, with all God gave them in the garden, they didn't have to do anything. They, while they slept, beautiful, great-tasting fruit grew around them. And he gives us everything. And it just seems to me that uh, a lack of gratitude was quite prevalent in the garden, mm -hmm. just like it is today. It, it's, but it's true. That, that's true even for, even for those born again, isn't it? What, what's that? It's true even for those who are born again, right? Like, yeah. I should be thankful enough to God. I should see all that God has given me and not revile when reviled, right? right. Man, that's hard to do in real time, isn't it? Yes. This is why yeah. the New Testament yeah. is full of all these do's and do nots, because, like, th this is what you do, you know, as a, not to earn your salvation, but this is what you do out of gratitude to God for saving you, and we have a hard time doing it. Yes. Thank you. No, we cut that out. If you watch the video, you can still get it, I think. No. Right? Oh, no, it's probably off by then. Actually, the, vi the video sometimes cuts you off. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not complaining. Listen to the podcast. You can slow that down, too, I'm if you want. I'm complaining. I'm just saying. Antonio, Antonio likes to listen to me after the fact and slow me down to half time. If you, just I get it. Just in case you folks don't know, on Spotify... <laughs> There is a, yeah. and it actually names it. It's called the Pastor Lee Slowdown. And <laughs> <laughs> you can also put other podcasts up to like two and a half speed, and it, it, then it, it sounds like it's me. No, but it's, it's true. He, we, he and I have had this discussion already. But hey, listen, it's nothing that he doesn't know about, because when he started here, his wife used to have a sign that said, She had a turtle. My, when, when, when I first started here and I started preaching regularly, my wife had a little cardboard turtle on a stick. And she would sit over here and I'd be going. And when I saw the turtle and, like this, I'd have to be, So. <laughs> True story. We right. listen. I've tried, I've improved as much as I'm going to. I grew up in northern New Jersey. 
You're all from here. You should have no problem listening to a guy talking really fast from Belleville. Come on. <laughs> I'm from Belleville. I have to do that. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you for your goodness, Lord. I thank you for great conversation, Lord, great uh, fun that we have together, God. But I thank you most of all, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us through your written word, Lord, but through the living word, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us a means whereby we can be made right with you, God, that we can repent of our sin because you have paid the price for us. You are both just and the justifier of those who come to you, Lord, and we thank you for that. So just bless us, Lord. May your word take deep root in our heart. May we see the importance of knowing what you truly have said, Lord, that we may not be deceived, that we may not let our desires get the better of us, Lord. May we focus fully on you. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.